Once upon a time, travel shows were stodgy as fuck. Television tourism of yonder was populated with pleasant, proper people who strolled the Champs-Élysées or the beaches of Rio in order to show you how to do pleasant, proper, and usually prepackaged things. But it's too easy to be snooty about a place like this. Early travel shows regarded the locals as curiosities. Interaction with the host was either staged or kept at a respectable distance, while finding the ideal yacht and shopping for bargains was paramount. So what would this cost me? Up until the 1990s, travel shows were mostly about watching a trusted host sniffing his way through fine wineries, pacing through Baroque-era museums, lounging around four-star hotels. When do I get my bail out? and indulging in the sensual pleasures of eating familiar fare with the right fork at the right restaurant and always with the right kind of people. About the time that global capitalism put distant travel within the range of an ambitious backpacker, all that began to change. Travel TV went from advertising the lifestyles of the rich and famous to adventure tourism for the young and penniless. Shows like Globe Trekker showed hosts pounding vodka inside of private homes of the newly opened nations of the erstwhile Iron Curtain. Your wild-eyed 20-something host happily ditched the salad forks of France and gave you a glimpse of the back alleys of Bangkok. The hosts were real people, and so were the people they met. Their travels were rough and risky. They gave the distinct impression that for a few weeks, a person of ordinary means could live like Indiana Jones. The catch was that you had to want it so badly, you were willing to live in a rat-infested slum to do it, which, for a certain kind of traveler, was half the fun. But the best by far of this new breed of adventure travel television shows belonged to Anthony Bourdain. Bourdain, who began every show with a parental advisory warning, was 10 times snarkier than all the other hosts put together. His punk nonchalance stuck out like a middle finger to every travel show that had ever gone before him. He savaged overhyped celebrity chefs by name and held in righteous contempt every culinary fad and pompous ideology that stood in the way of the pure enjoyment of food. I liked him immediately. I'm frequently asked why vegans are, are the enemy of everything that is good and decent and must be hunted down and destroyed so their genes don't pass on to future generations. Bourdain got away with being such an arrogant weasel because underneath the swagger was an empathetic guy with a big idea that's been so widely copied, it's hard to remember how novel it once was. Any culture, no matter how foreign, can be understood through its food. And so Bourdain was equally at home twirling spaghetti in the swankiest restaurants of Rome and scarfing down warthog anus with the tribes of Namibia. To eat. Mm. He traveled for all the right reasons. To understand the world and to understand himself. I remember sitting on my couch in Los Angeles, alone and unemployed, watching the first few episodes of A Cook's Tour. The feasts he ate, the flavors he described, and the people he met. He made the whole world seem alive, no doubt even as he was contemplating his own death. Hour after hour, I watched as he traveled to Morocco and Japan, places I'd only dreamed about visiting. And I started thinking, maybe I could do that. Maybe I should do that. And so I did. Within a month, I was on a plane to India. No sooner did my feet hit the tarmac in Mumbai, I immediately and very self-consciously began living La Vida Bourdain. I saved rupees by living in dumps and drug dens, and I spent what I could on the best eats that the city had to offer. Legendary food stalls like Bedemia Kebab and swanky eateries like Trishna blew my taste buds away, cooking up dishes that were too strong or too strange or too spiced for the American palate. In between my Hydra body biryanis and the manifold pleasures of the tali plate, I broke non bread with imams in the mosques of Ajmer, ate dalbat with feudal Rajasthani landlords, and dined with countless others whose lives were unquantifiably different from my own. Two weeks later, I'd move on to another city and do it all over again. I had no real plan, I just kept moving. At this point, I'd just seen my first missile strike. It was on the airport that we'd flown into in Beirut. No Reservations began as a show about food and culture. 
But with the outbreak of the 2006 Lebanon War, Bourdain and his crew were forced by circumstance to become now war correspondents. Now, is Tony Bourdain. You were in Beirut shooting an episode of your show. What happened? I was with a Sunni, a Shiite, and a Christian at the time. When we started to hear gunfire and see uh, cars filled with Hezbollah supporters. The Beirut episode of No Reservations permanently changed the course of the show as politics became as important as food. You sleep through, uh, but you wake up to bombing, you watch bombing from the pool during the afternoon, you go to sleep to bombing. Around the time No Reservations began its slow pivot into politics, I found myself doing the same. Our top story in Nepal, government forces fired on thousands of pro-democracy demonstrators today. For weeks, Nepalese have protested the country's non-party political system. I took an internship as a photojournalist with the Kathmandu Post. Nepal's toxic brew of ruling monarchists, insurgent Maoists, and ethnically based political alliances set the stage for the culmination of a 15-year civil war. What began as an adventure in food and travel was fast becoming a life in news photography. When the dust settled, the world's last Hindu king was forced from his throne, replaced by the violent birth of a troubled democracy. I can't wait to get out there and really understand what Carboni Cuisine is all about. The main reason I'm here is to understand the food. Really. I returned to Los Angeles to find the television completely Bourdainified. Television had spawned a dozen Anthony Bourdain clones, each one wandering the world in a weekly quest for that white whale of serious travel hosts, cultural authenticity, and clicks. While the snarky host who got my ass off the couch in the first place was now a legit celebrity. First time I came here, it was a transformative uh, experience. But Bourdain's knockoffs and clones never understood that the journey outward was always something of a ruse. Even while reporting on far-flung conflicts, Bourdain used travel and food as vehicles for introspection. Show after show, he left us clues about his state of mind, concealed inside Gallo's humor and easily forgotten in the pleasures of an exquisite meal. I love this place. I want to die here already. And I might yet. Perfect seaweed and perfect uni is just, oh man, I'm, I'm ready to die now. <laughs> if you can't enjoy even a nice, stinky, runny, ripe cheese like this, you may as well kill yourself now. So Tony, what brought you here? Bourdain's dark inner life was never more on display than on a visit to Argentina, where he saw a local therapist. Uh, I will find myself in an airport, for instance, and I'll order an airport hamburger. It's an insignificant thing. It's a small thing. It's a hamburger, yeah. but it's not a good one. Suddenly, I look at the hamburger and I find myself in a spiral of depression yes. that can last for days. In the end, Anthony Bourdain couldn't be contained by this world not by its political or existential borders. The, 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 the meal of my life. He passed through some of the world's most dangerous places unharmed, only to turn the belt of his hotel robe into a hangman's noose. For all the books he wrote and the shows he narrated, Bourdain left without a word of explanation. So I'm left with a sense of loss and an enduring gratitude for the recorded memory of a life lived spectacularly. <laughs>